Uh, you want to stick around for that. Uh, this presentation is meant to be an overall view of how to implement big data architecture. It's not meant to be technical. Um, there are technical areas of this, you, but if you are only uh, just now being introduced to Hadoop, this is an excellent presentation for you. If you're a Java developer, this gives you the whole big picture, the whole scheme of what's happening in the industry. If you're a DBA, you're going to see schemas that you recognize, but only in a big data way. So if you're very, very technical, we're not going to deep dive into the technical areas of this. So that's why I put down presentation one, because this is a uh, aggregate of about five different technical discussions all rolled up so you get a big overview and get a really good idea of where big data is headed. And I uh, took the advantage of many, many resources, compiled it together, and you're going to get a very good roadmap by the time this is done. One of the things that we try to present is this idea of what is Hadoop. Uh, the presentation will go over many different types of architects, but as you will see, Hadoop comes to the top of the uh, chart time and time again as being one of the leaders in the big data uh, movement and why it's so important. And we're going to prove to you why that is one of the best platforms that you can use in, uh, in your big data project. And you'll have a lot of information uh, available to you if you want to dig down deeper into that. Um, oops, it'll go this way. Uh, we're going to go over a big data platform, architecture. We're going to give you the, the experts, the subject matter experts definition of what big data actually is. Uh, what do you need to consider when you're classifying big data? And all the way down to data as a service and analytics as a service. And we're going to give a nice overview of different methodologies. What I'm proposing here is the best practice approach to developing big data. And it's not my approach. It comes from many different sources. Here we go. These are the people that I have referenced when it comes to the strategic direction. As you know, this, this market is growing by leaps and bounds. It seems like every month something new comes out about it, and you're always playing catch up. So what I'm going to do is give you the basic foundation, and then you're going to be in a position to decide which roadmap you want to go to. Uh, during the presentation, I'm going to be showing you key ideas and critical success, success factors that if you don't do this, you're putting the entire project in jeopardy. And, and it'll make perfect sense what that is when you see some of these gotchas. I also drew upon a wide range of white papers from uh, Hortonworks, to Hive, Informatica, uh, IBM, and Cardera, they all complement each other, and I've used direct uh, quotes from these articles. And this slide deck is available to you. If you want a good de deep dive into what the overall uh, information I'm providing, these are five of the best places I could tell you to go to. So when you have questions today, um, I want to keep it at a high level. I'll probably be pointing to one of these white papers and saying you might have to take a deeper dive look into what that's about. Or we can give another presentation later on in the year and do a deeper dive into some of these areas. I'm going to point out three areas, three slides, where I think we could go down a little deeper and it would benefit the entire group. And that's why I'm calling this presentation number one. Okay. So, but let's get a foundation of what's going on. And I want to start with the idea of where you see schemas being one size fits all. If you did any relational modeling at all, for the most part, didn't matter if you put it in any RDBMS, that, that many, that parent-child relationship would fit into almost any, any uh, database you wanted, from Access to Oracle to SQL Server. And even your OLAP, your dimensions, your cubes, for the most part, generally speaking, 
you design a fact table according to Kimball or an aggregate table according to Inman, for the most part, you pick a database and you could throw it in there and it would work maybe a little adjustments, a little uh, tinkering, but you can get that schema to work. When big data came along, that all went away. That all went away. And if you take that approach with your big data projects, you're in trouble. And what we're going to do is I'm going to pretend that everyone here today has been assigned a big data project. And what we're going to do, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to select our big data platform, which is a mistake. Okay, but let's pretend this is our team. We're going to build big data platform. Which one do we go for? Okay. The first thing, there's polystructured, which is NoSQL, and there's relational, which is SQL. Uh, SQL also is your ACID type of approach, and NoSQL is your base type of approach. So are we going to put it in a relational model, which there's more out there than what you realize now, or are we going to go with NoSQL where it's, you'll get the transactions eventually? So that's the first, is that the first decision we make? Well, how many of them are there? Well, take a look at this. These are just the different types of big data classifications. We have data grid, caching, columnar, distributed file systems, document, and indexing. And on the NoSQL side, I mean on the relational side, we have columnar, analytics, NewSQL, and graph. Well, let's pick, a, let's, pick, let's pick one. How many are out there? This is how many are in one of the documents, one of the graphs I pulled. This is a landscape of how many big data selections are out there for you to decide. Now, you won't find all of them out there. I just pulled this out of uh, the web. There's many landscapes, and I've highlighted down here which one I've chosen for tonight's uh, presentation. Uh, if you want to take a look at that, there are others out there that might have the one that you're looking for. This is just for my presentation. I don't endorse any one of these to any great extent. This just gives you a good example for discussion purposes of how many databases are out there that accommodate big data. So right out of the gate, which one do you choose? More importantly, why? So the first question when you take a look at this is, okay, one size might not fit all here. So of that, what types of questions would you ask to know which ones would be the best for, your, for our project? What type of data? What is big data? So with using that landscape, here's the key idea. It, there's not one big data database that accommodates all big data types. Doesn't exist. Just doesn't exist. One size does not fit all. And you need to know the data type and architecture to select the most appropriate big data database. Does that make sense? That makes sense. What type of data do you have? And what are the questions about that, those types of big data you need to know to select your database? So let's go that route. Okay, we're not going to select our big data database yet. Let's talk about the big data architecture. What type of data do we have and what type of architecture do we need to select our big data platform? So what types of big data are out there? Does anybody know any, any, any suggestions? How many different types of big data are there? Well, the definition of big data, it's easier to first talk about what big data is not, and then we'll talk about what it is. And big data is not fact tables and dimension tables. They complement each other. Big data will not replace your dimensional diagrams, uh, your dimensional models, your cubes. It will not replace that. That has its place. Big data is working with clickstream data, social network data, semi-structured emails, comments, sensor data, tweets, Basically, your character data, which cubes are very, very bad at handling. 
So right now, we're looking at these types of data characteristics when we talk about big data. What is big data? Well, we've got to consider the data source, where are we getting it from, what content, structure, who's going to use it, are you going to analyze it real time or batch, real time would be your flu, processing, are you going to do predictive analytics, or are you just going to do querying and reporting? What hardware? Are you going to use your current hardware or are you going to do state-of-the-art hardware? Data type. Data frequency. And the chart that's available that is easier to understand is based upon this selection, you determine the database platform you want to use. So you go through here and you Pick out what type of data you currently have. Based upon that selection, it's just a natural process to go and select the best database type that fits your selection. It's that simple. Because they're out there to accommodate all these types, and whichever road map you take uh, based upon your big data is the database design for you. So far, so good. Now I'm going to throw you a curveball. How do you know which type of big data you have? Now, you don't have to squint your eyes on this. This is an article from uh, Hortonworks just last, just last week. Hortonwork, if you, if you uh, subscribe to Hortonwork, they highlighted Newstar and, and all of those. And one of the things that they point out, which I thought was very poignant over here, is that depending on your industry, depending on the type of industry you're in, the type of big data you're collecting is specific to your company. i got several examples to show you. If you're in the utilities, you want machine-generated data. If you're in telecommunications, you want web and social data. Or transaction data. So if you're, if you're working for a company that's in utilities, you shouldn't be collecting transaction data. Excuse me? Excuse me? Well, let, 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 me, let me give you a better example. In the, if you work for a, a car company, you should be collecting sensor data from the cars. All right? And sensor data is uh, big data. Sensor data, uh, the day will come when you go to your car dealership and they're going to pull your sensor information from the car you're driving and your insurance rate will be based upon how you drive that car. So while you're not... That's cute. Yeah, that's what all state does. That's what all state uh -huh. does. And you can buy sensor data off the web right now. But if you're in retail, you shouldn't be collecting sensor data. But, transactional. but the you what where I'm headed here is if you're going to do predicting power consumption, that's the type of data you should be collecting for predictive power consumption. Yeah, you also should be collecting data about my customers. You yes. Know, what they're going to buy, yeah. which is transactional data. Yeah, and we'll get to that. We'll get to that. I'm saying for Predictive power consumption, the type of data, the big data you're collecting for that specific use case is machine generated. Okay, so you're literally talking of a specific use case, not a business. Type. That's correct, a, a specific use case. A business type. 
Okay, well, let's, 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 let's move on. Let's do this. There are guidelines to help suggest big data types that are commonly used by each industry. And again, we go to Hortonworks. And here's what, these are suggestions. These are not mandates. These are not requirements. These are suggestions that if you're in financial services, your competitors are probably collecting information on new account risks, trading risk, and insurance underwriting. And these are the types of big data that traditionally go with that type of data collection. That's all, that's my only point. All right, and, and we'll get to the transaction data of utility companies in about four or five more slides here. If you're in retail, you want a 360 degree view of the customer. You want website optimization. The point I'm trying to make here is that just because you have big data doesn't mean your company, your business can take advantage of. And these are guidelines and suggestions that you should be going to your boss or to the, to the uh, uh, your steering committee about saying, hey, we, we should be collecting this type of information because our competitors are, or better yet, our competitors aren't, and we can get a competitive edge. So based upon the industry you're in, you have guidelines of the types of big data that you should be collecting. And the point, the takeaway from all this is validate that the data you're collecting has business value. That's where I was headed. It does you no good if you're in the retail market and you're collecting sensory data. You can say you have a big data project, but if you can't show value of why you're collecting it, we're calling this a critical success factor. 55% of big data projects don't get completed. That's a quote from a report. There's the link. Uh, big data, what your IT team wants you to know. And many others fall short of their objectives. Well, this is one, re one reason why, not the only reason, but make certain that if you are in a big data project that you have clearly identified the profit uh, associated with that. Yes? I'm sorry. How can you know up front whether this data is going to have a business value in the long run? The whole point of big data, you collect as much data as possible no. to discover. Let me finish, please. To discover some new trends and some new things that people didn't thought about. That is the whole point of big data. If you are doing anything else, you are repeating the same thing that was done 20 years ago using new technology. No, the data architect from an that that's one approach, but from a data architect perspective, if you have data that's not providing any value, it's causing problems. And this is one of the problems that people are trying to solve because we are throwing away by far more data than we need to because we don't know whether this data has the business value. You are defeating the purpose. One of the underlying principles of this is something called an operational effectiveness model that clearly, clearly identifies the value of the data you have without needing to be analyzed. And I would suggest you take a look at it. This is from a data architect perspective. And it's a basic rule. If you're not using the data, if it has no value, it's causing problems. That's the data architect uh, basic rule, guideline. Okay, we differ. I respect that. One of the, one of the things I want to point out is that if you can identify the business needs by your data type, if you can do that, you then can identify the big data architecture. And if you can do that, you can identify the big data platform. That's all my point here is. Okay? So, in the big data architecture realm, 
Let's take a look at the 10 different types of architecture that we have here. And what I'm going to do is go through 10 different schemas for you, showing you the different ways you can deploy a big data architecture. And one caveat, I only pulled what I could from the internet. Not everything I'm going to show you is a schema. I couldn't find schemas. So some of them are definitely topologies, and I apologize for that. And I do have examples of uh, one representation from each of the groups and give you an overall view of what 10 basic big data architects look like. And whether you implement them or not, it's to your advantage to know there are 10 out there and basically what they are aiming to do and what their purpose is. Because not one of those covers all of the big data. Not one you may want to implement more than one, depending on the type of data that you have. And if you all remember the parent-child relationship or the fact dimension table and how comfortable you got with that, let me show you in the first schema is a relational graph. They look at relationships and the three that I, that was, was on my landscape for Data Architect was Apache Hama, Giraffe, and Neo4j. And I've been working with Neo4j. And this is a schema in Neo4j. And this one takes a good, uh, uh, takes the idea, you, you've heard of a, uh, when people go, when men go to buy diapers, they also buy beer. And there's a good relationship between, if you're going to have a sale on diapers, you might want to jack up the price of beer. Excuse me? Market basket analysis. Market basket analysis. And we'll get to that in data uh, analytics as a platform. This is excellent for market basket analysis. It, it, is, it is about generally speaking, a hundred times faster than designing it in a relational model. About a hundred times faster. So that's what that one uh, accommodates. Then you have the uh, multi-MPP diagram. It's a share nothing architecture. It's doing analytics. Here are seven types of vendors out there that support this. And this is column-oriented storage organization. And again, the idea is there on performance, sequential access, and single record retrieval and updates. And an example of that would be Vertica or Par Excel, where you are processing using your columns. And again, the idea is performance while you're doing your analytics on your big data. No, nope, that's a different one. No, nope, nope, that's, that's, that's no SQL. Uh, right now we're just on SQL side on relational. We have analytical MPP, online transactional processing, data warehouse, and mixed workloads. This is where you want to pull in some of your current information from your data warehouse and merge it with your big data. And again, this is still relational. We're on the relational side of things now. And Oracle Exadata shows you how to do that. Relational, new SQL. You scale out the relational databases by virtualizing a distributed database environment. Volt, Scalebase, and Amazon RDS. And this is an example of VoltDB and Scalebase. And as you can see, you take, and these are relational. You scale them out, you put them into Scalebase, and it separates them out that way. Now we're into NoSQL. Now we're into where transactions eventually get there. And the schemas get a little less clear.
clear, a little fuzzy in these areas. Polystructure, document industry, highly scalable, but you're dealing with in indexing your documents. Your documents have a little key associated with it. Provides a distributive search and index replication. Apache Solar, Index Tank, and Ativo do that very, very well. And here is a relational model, but again, these are just indexes. There's little diagrams and little diamonds. They're just indexes to different types of document information. But it accesses it very, very quickly. Polystructured document without the indexing. Uh, they serve web apps directly, on the fly document transportation, real time transformations. Uh, good example doctor's offices who want to store medical records real quickly, throws it on the web. One of these would accommodate that very well. MongoDB is well known, RavenDB and CouchDB. And again, these are documents. So the schema here is very basic. But notice there are no indexes. So you are accumulating documents, but you don't really need that performance, but you can relate them to other items as well. Students, courses, and instru instructors on MongoDB course tracking, but that's what the schema would look like in a non-indexing way. So what, what exactly do you mean by Lacks a schema or a rich predefined data structure. Like well, this schema, the, schema. This, this schema just has ID to ID, but these are not tables, these are documents. Right, but it's, it's a document schema. It's a yes. definition of the document. That's right. So it doesn't lack document schemas. Right. I'm, I'm sorry, you're right. You're right. This would be the overall what the schema would actually look like. This would be the physical way it would be implemented. Very, very basic schema. Then we have polystructured key value stored in memory data grid. Well, in memory means you cache, partition, replicate, and manage application data and businesses across multiple servers, full elastic memory based upon a storage grid, virtualized, free of memory, potentially large number of Java virtual machines, make them behave like single key accessible storage pools for application state. Uh, all the here as well. Probably, I'm, like I said before, I told you, I'm just going off of what the landscape no, I'm going off of what the landscape diagram I had. And that's why I said I chose one, but you're absolutely right. They probably go elsewhere, but the landscape diagram I chose did not put Volt in here. It probably could go in there is what, I, what my caveat was. You're right. Would you put HBase in here? Um, so yes, you could, yes. I'm just trying to understand where you got it broken up. Well, no, again, I, I want to keep saying I'm just going off of the landscape diagram for discussion purposes. Some of these do land in other areas. I'm just trying to give you an idea overall of what, what it is. I'm not trying to classify every vendor out there where they belong. I'm just trying to describe overall what the classifications are. But you're absolutely right. Can other ones go in here? Yeah, absolutely, you're right. But that, that's not the purpose of the discussion. Okay. That's correct. But uh, all these document databases, they support indexes. Yes. But uh, it's kind of like contradictory, like uh, you see like uh, others like Mongo, they don't support indexes. You put all the documents and you fetch based on the index. Yes, and you can. This one, it's not required. This one it is. So you're just like generalizing it? Okay? Yes, just generalizing it. 
This one you have to put indexes on. Required. It's a requirement. It's a requirement. And if you see, it, the, the keyword here is document indexing. And down here, it's optional. Does it have indexes? Yes. Do you have to use them? No. No. And again, the schema does accommodate that. But if you notice, the schema does not show indexes. Yes. That's that's exactly right. In this case, they're highly similar, and it's up to you. Do you want them required or not? And again, it's it's your choice. I'm just trying to differentiate the, the different characteristics. But you're right. Yeah. Could you put indexes on those? Yeah, they're available. Very similar. Very very similar. But this one, it's a little more stringent. You have to have indexes, and you have to design them into your schema. Have to, they're required. Down here, they're a little lax, but they still have them, yeah. Uh, key value stored. Now, again, here's a topology, and I'm sorry, uh, but it gives you an idea of what happens to your database schema This is Oracle's product. And again, the idea here is that it's stored and cached in several areas. And they communicate master-slave uh, uh, based upon your reads and your writes. So it's very flexible, very, very dynamic, and very, very fast. Key value stored columnar. Um, columnar speaks to the map reduce procedure that Hadoop is known for. Uh, Apache HBase, Hypertable, Cumulo, Cassandra are all types of polystructured key value stored using columns. Random, real time, write access to your big data, hosting very large tables, billions of rows. These are large tables. The example I have for this one is Apache HBase. And the idea here is that you read the data in fast. Store it and get it out fast. And again, we could do a deeper dive into exactly how that's done. I'm just showing you it's a key value stored in columnar. And then we get to distributed file system. Storage, large processing of data sets on clusters of commodity hardware, distributed, scalable, portable file system. And the Hadoop ecosystem, and then a typical, as best as I could, schema of what Hadoop looks like. More importantly, it's, it's probably uh, or, or uh, with a layer of hive over top of it. But that's what a schema would look like. And again, this is the ecosystem of, of uh, Hadoop. And all I was trying to do here is to let you know there's 10 different types of architecture out there that you can choose from. And you should be aware of which one best suits the project you're looking at. So overall, those are the 10 classifications I think you'd want to know about. Hadoop is the number one distributed file system and used for big data projects. Right now, that's a fact. Hadoop is used as the shared data source platform to merge and standardize big data with legacy data. That's a fact. Data as a service. Applications should be based from a single data source platform. Well, of the examples I provided, the best one that can take all of the data sources and provide them into one data as a service is Hadoop. They can read any type of data you want, merge it into one platform, and you can use that platform to pull your APIs 
on the put your APIs on top of to provide data to any place you want to go. Hadoop has the ability of taking any one of these data types and placing it into one spot. Now that's powerful. That's a powerful concept. And the single data management system says one single source of data, which gets back to your data warehouse vision statement, one single source. Hadoop can do that. Hadoop is an excellent choice in starting to build your shared data source platform. So it can merge all your different data sources into one spot. It can be your system of record and your master data management system because of that. If you merge all your data sources into one platform, that can become your system of record for different objects. At the same time, that becomes your MDM as well. So it's not scattered across five different systems. That's important to know about Hadoop. Critical success factors. You can spend a lot of time converting time. And one of the items that they stress when you do data as a service is you have to standardize your date time format. And it's suggested, and at, on one of the slides that I'm not going to show you, but it comes with the slide deck, it explains the different types of time format that are used internationally, and the one suggested is this one. ISO 8601 specifies uh, uh, representations of date and time. Because, as we know in data warehousing, your dim date dimension is the most used dimension. I don't care what, what else is out there, that dim date get, gets used a lot. So what they're saying is, in the background, from a data architecture perspective, when you do merge all your source systems into a single platform, in this case we're suggesting Hadoop, make certain that date and time are standardized. If they're not, you're not going to, you're not going to get the performance you want, and you may not even get the connectivity that you want, the relationships you want. That's a critical success factor right there. From a data architect's perspective, they're saying, make certain you describe the, the data that you're coming in, that you're using, adequately. ID should never be a column name. Now, we all know ID is a column name. But because you're the one designing it and moving it in, sales ID is too generic, but sales representative reporting ID is friendly and clearly named. In your data platform, uh, your single data platform, use very, very descriptive and friendly names. I'll show you why here in just a minute. Try to avoid just pulling in the data and not classifying it or naming it more friendly for the end user. There's a really, really big benefit to that. We're going to get to that in just a, just a few more slides. But these can cause problems for your end users, your analytics, these are what sometimes cause the project to stall. Because you're too busy converting and explaining and it's just a waste of time. Hadoop is also used as the shared analytical platform to merge and standardize analysis. And this is where we get back to your transaction data. Because Hadoop is a platform, it can read data from any one of these vendors and place it into a single management system and do analytics on it. Hadoop can do analytics. I think that's what Hive is all about. 
So it can take your data sources, put them into your database architect, and turn it into analytics as a service on the same platform. Can you give an example of how maybe would do any of those? Uh, it's a, some of these have direct connections to Hadoop. Most and, and as this as this environment grows, there's a very good potential one day they all will have direct connectivity to Hadoop. What does that mean, direct connectivity? Uh, you don't have to download an extract file and load it into an HDFS format. You can load it directly from uh, uh, I'm going to say scale based directly to Hadoop. So you're sending over a file. A a massaged file used specifically for analytical purposes. Yes. In a different format. What format? Or whatever is needed for the type of analytics you want to do. Well, the whole point of that is your transformation is going to be up to you at the time that you decide what question you're going to ask. Yes. But that's not actually dependent on any of those systems anyways. You're pulling the data out and storing it in some format. So it's kind of arbitrary. As, as I load data into scale base, it would get loaded automatically into my analytical platform. Automatically. How would it know? Yeah. How, how would it build that? Not Hadoop. It would be these. So you're saying these vendors are going to just start pushing their data into Hadoop? You can trigger. You can trigger data once uploaded into these vendors. Trigger it to load Hadoop. Yes. I can prove it. I can prove so it. And all of these vendors right now already push all their data to Hadoop? No. No. At some point they will. Really? What if they disappear before that? Then your, your point and, and some of them will. <laughs> some of them will, but my point here is that two points. Your analytics should be on one platform. Point one. Point two. You can use Hadoop to pull data or have data push to Hadoop from any one of these vendors. Now, what you're arguing is how that's actually done. And for some of these vendors, that can be done automatically. All my point here is that you can take a pull or push from any one of these vendors and put it on one platform. How we do that, we can talk about that vendor by vendor. My only point here is analytics should be based on a single data source. Two, you can pull or push from any one of these vendors to get that data to put it on your analytical platform. Beyond that, that's a separate discussion. Right. My, my point is, at the beginning of the slide, you said Hadoop can work with any of these. That's not a true statement. Okay, okay, you're right. I, I, I'll back off of that. You're absolutely right. Are there direct connectivity lines that are seamless and transparent? Absolutely not. They do not exist. Can you pull data in to form a single platform from these vendors? The answer is yes. That's what I meant to say. Sorry if I miscommunicated that. There's no easy button on any of these. You have to set it up. Some get triggered, some get pulled. It varies vendor by vendor. The point here being you can place it on a single analytical platform, and Hadoop is really good at doing that. That that's one example. That's one example of what I meant. They all don't. They all don't do that. It's evolving. It's evolving. This whole area is evolving. It's like uh, you see lights, uh, uh, like you know, from the uh, vendor, like you know, the down to Hadoop, yep. and, and to some other vendors also. Yes. And there, I think, so, there are like so many uh, dots in that uh, data yes. they're trying to connect. It would be a good presentation to take a look at how this would happen real time. 
for all those vendors. That would be a good presentation to do live demos showing you how you could move everything to one single platform so you get a feel for who's advanced, who's evolved, and more importantly, who wants to evolve to provide that type of service. Is that right? You, can we all agree with that? That would be a very valuable presentation, I think, for certain people in this group. Can be done, too. The next point here goes back to our analytical platform. There are guidelines to help suggest analytics, KPIs, profit drivers for big data that are common to each, each industry. And that gets back to our market basket analytics. If you take a look, if you're going to do, where, I think I have market basket here somewhere, predicting a sequence, discrete attribute, common items in transactions, these typical are, 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 are uh, these are typical algorithms you use to analyze that type of information. I mean, they're common. You can use other things, but traditionally this is what you use. You don't need to know how the algorithm works or how it's designed. You only need to know the parameters needed to run them. Uh, uh, on these, you know exactly what the algorithm is doing. Otherwise, you can never verify that the data that you are receiving is the correct result. No, I, I, I miscommunicated. Let me try it a different way. If I run a sequence clustering algorithm, I never review the code for a sequence clustering algorithm. I never review the code that gets run. Okay? So you have to understand what it does. Yes, you have to understand. Yeah, that's my point. You have to understand what goes in and what comes out, but I don't have to alter the code to get it to run. The code should run. Given the input, I should understand the output. When was the last time you got a piece of code that did exactly what you we're, we're talking standardized algorithms that, are, that come with packages. These, by the way, are algorithms within Microsoft uh, SSIS packages. A -S. A -S. Oh, and AES. These are standard algorithms in analytical services that you run to perform that type of analysis. Do you ever open this up and read the code? Never. 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 They're standard, right? and you read up on what the input is, and you understand the output. You never open the code. <coughs> and here we go, here's market analysis, which you talked about earlier. So if you can identify the type of analysis you want to do, Here's the type of algorithms they suggest you should use them for. And again, going back to Microsoft real quickly, these are data mining algorithms that are used. Naive Bayes, clustering, neural networks. And real quickly, I just want to show you some examples of the charts that get produced as a result of running these algorithms. Now here's where you have to know what you're doing. Here's where the skill set comes in. What does that mean? What do you communicate back to the business? This is the value. And what I'm trying to show you here is this, this one we all recognize as a typical regression chart over, most of the time it's over time or date, but that's a, a typical regression chart. Here's clustering segmented uh, segmentation, nearest neighbor, association rules, de decision tree, very, very important, sequence association, neural networks. And my only point here is that if you know the business needs, by the type of data you're collecting. Again, hypothetically, let's just pick a business, uh, let's say uh, automobiles, 
and you're collecting sensor data, well, then you kind of know the big data architecture. And we already talked about, well, then you probably know the big data platform. What I'm also suggesting is you probably know the big data analytics you're going to want to do against that sensor data. And because of that, you already know your big data analytical platform because that is a domino. It just falls into, well, if you're doing those analytics, that's the type of analytical platform you should be creating. So generally speaking, for big data projects, you start with identifying the use cases that the business needs. From there, you can identify the big data architecture, do your analytics, your big data platform, and your big data analytical platform. Now, this is a different approach than what we're used to in relational or in dimensional modeling. And the idea here is the focus is on what does, what does the business gain value from big data? And there are guidelines to help you figure that out. And in some cases, you need to actually go and build to start collecting that information. But once you do that, when you get down to here, you can start to prove value of your big data project. And again, this is just a best case, best practice approach. I, I don't know of any company that's gone through this, the way that, I've that, the way that they diagram it, but this is the best case scenario and the best practice approach to building a big data architecture. And since analytics could be based from a single data source, we have a dupe here. Now watch, let's recap real fast. We're almost done. We're almost done. Two more slides. Hadoop can be used as your system of record, master data management, data as a service, and that little guy there, analytics as a service. All on one platform. Only, only Hadoop can do this because it's a, it's a platform. What tools uh, does it offer for analytics as a service? Uh, Hive. Hive is, is the preferred one right now. It's in the tool set for that. Hive is basically a query language, right? Yes, and it's not an advanced query like uh, uh, analytics yet, but it can do so. How about the house? Yes. Yep. And they're still growing. It's still, it's starting to get better and better with each release. Can you repeat what the question was? Uh, is Mahout used for analytics? And it's basic right now. It's it, They're still growing that out. I think like R and Duke would be the, one of the better ones for us. Yeah, R would fit into your analytical platform as up here somewhere. And what I'm pointing out up here is that we have Tableau, Datamir, you can use Data Nitro to uh, export it out to Excel. You can use Power Pivot to export it out. There's, you, you can play around with it. Yeah, this were R on Hadoop. Yes, so. R on Hadoop. Yeah. And R would be up here. So are you suggesting that we put uh, big data out of Hadoop and put it into the R system? R creates its own set of tables to do its analytics. So you extract the data? Yeah. But R is very powerful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, R is state-of-the-art analytics. Yeah. So, so, so basically, you're saying that we need to extract the data out of the Hadoop, put it into R, and then do the analytics instead of doing it on the platform, on the Hadoop platform itself. Because the, the platform itself is still maturing. And I guarantee, I, I believe one day it will be just as good as R. I, I can't prove that right now. And I believe one day it will be as good, but as of today, no, R is much, much more flexible and much more, oh, it just does everything. Yeah. I mean, it just does everything. So all the is not Yeah. Yeah. I realized this is a 10 API, but 
found out in, in playing around with these growing technologies is about every six months a new release is made. And about every six months you have to play around with it again. So this landscape I'm showing you at, a, at this level, at a vendor level, is changing. It's very, very volatile what's happening in this section. And what I'm trying to do is give you a layout of if you are interested in data as a service, analytics as a service, the, the overall scope here should be get it onto one platform. Hadoop is probably going to accommodate every everything you can give it. That, that's really all I'm trying to get here. When it gets into something like R or some of the other, like Tableau, which is very popular, they're, they're still more powerful than what anything I can tell you about Hadoop. Okay? At this point in time. But they're trying to catch up to that. But Hadoop can give us, can create a centralized repository that feeds. That is, you got the idea. Bingo. The Hadoop can give you your data as a service on the same platform as your analytics as a service. And through my research, I haven't found any other vendor that can make that statement. So Hadoop is. I'm going to suggest a marvelous first step into big data. And if you do that, and I think this is the last slide, oh, schema on read. I'm going to skip over this schema on read. Um, this, came, this is from Hive. And basically all this is saying is that your end user decides the schema, not the data architect. The old way of doing it, the data architect tells you the name of the column, the data type, you've got to have a data dictionary, you've got to explain it to your end user, a lot of work. Schema on, uh, read, on, on read, your end users now become the data architect. They determine what the column names actually are for their specific purpose. And what happens, here's the examples. I'm going to allow, if you want to read more, the, it's part of the slide deck. The benefits and downsides of schema on write and schema on read. This is the last slide, and here's, here's what I want you to understand. If you take away one key point from this presentation, this is the one I want you to take away. This is the direction that all big data is headed, is that your end users are now free to create their own schemas and to do their own analytics. If you take this approach, this best practice approach, put everything on one platform, standardize your time, put on really good column names, you give it over to your end users and it is truly self-servicing data and self-servicing BI. And that's the future of big data where the IT department and the data architects no longer have to create data dictionaries, explain what the report means, have meetings about how to improve it. That all goes away. And the experts that I reference, I'm going to go way to the front here. Hold on, I'm going to go way to the back, and way to the very first slide. Let's scheme real fast. These gentlemen, there we go. These gentlemen are the ones who are saying the future of big data is that your end users have the power to do all the analytics on their own. And that's a powerful direction to head in. Sorry, can you explain that statement? If I give you a, an analytics as a service and you understand what market basket analysis is, 
I don't need to show you how to do your market basket analysis. You can name a column anything you want in data as a service and run the analytics all on your own and produce the reports as often as you want. And you don't have to call me up to explain anything or to rename a column or to add a column. You got all the columns there named properly. And you can link them by time. If you get the date time format correct, you can link everything by time and produce wonderful analytics. So it's self-service BI. Is it similar to Informatica IDS? Yes, yes. And that's why I reference Informatica. Yes, Informatica. Yes. Very, very powerful tool. So if there's one thing to take away, just to repeat, you can create a self-service BI platform through Hadoop. And according to the subject matter experts on the future of databases and big data, that's where the industry is headed. And I just wanted to share that with you tonight. And let's see what else. I think we got it. Uh, the slide deck will be available. Uh, there are, oh, uh, let's go to the end real fast. Some housekeeping real fast. Here's an overview of the key ideas that I tried to discuss. Here's an overview of the critical success factors. Here are references to the ideas if you want to dig deeper. Here's the explanation of the time format date that's being suggested. And any questions or answers at this point? Yes. Uh, of all the ease of use of one system over the other, uh, what do you think about the ease of use? Like uh, how easy it is to develop uh, your, 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 your queries in reports in one system over the other? They, they, the, Can you the, the question. Excuse me? Uh, thank you. The question is how, easy, how important is ease of use in de developing your queries and your reports? Uh, really, I choose it. One system or the other. You list all the different you know, choices of, right. uh, of the databases. Well, that's, that's a difficult question to answer because it varies if, depending on the type of query you're actually doing. If you're just doing a, a spreadsheet, it's easy. If you're doing R analytics, not so easy. And that produces a spreadsheet-like report every, every so often. So it, it, I'd have to be given an, a, a better example, but the idea that I'm trying to suggest here is that you would have the right skill sets to produce any query on your own without having the IT department involved in it. So if you want to learn R and go through that, to produce very, very powerful and unbelievable, uh, meaningful statistical analysis, that's one thing. Or if you just want to do a dump and compare uh, regression charts, that's another. Ease of use, I think, is up to the end user. OK. Um, giveaways. We're going to give away. These little Hadoop elephants. And we're going to do it differently. We normally have little coupons. We're going to do it differently. How many here have watched uh, Monty Hall go into the audience and say, do you have a paper clip? Or do you have a wallet? What I'm going to do is I'm going to flip the slide. And if you want, if any one of those items are on your person, you come up and you will get a Hadoop elephant. So it's volunteering. You don't have to come up and get a Hadoop elephant. See, did you ever get a coupon and get something you really didn't want? OK. So this is a new way of doing it since it's a, a, a Hadoop meeting, which is new and different. I thought we'd try something new and different. I'll give you three things. If you have any one of these items on your person right now, come up, show me, and you'll get a free Hadoop elephant. Okay? 
a pen with a new yellow on it, a picture of an elephant, or the word Hadoop printed, not written. If you can find those, a Hadoop elephant is for you. And I want to thank you for coming out tonight. I hope I helped you understand some things. Thank you. Thank you.